let's just hit recording great so do remember there are emoticons in the chat as well that you can use so you can um, convey to us how you're getting on and uh, give some reactions to Shona's conversation so the webinar we're doing today is being brought to you by the alt open education special interest group um, we organize regular webinars to share open education and um, research and practice in the area and uh, Shona had presented this uh, or some uh, early results I think of the call cool study that you're going to talk to us about at, at your call um, and uh, I remember taking copious notes at the time and thinking I really must catch up again with Shona and it's my, to my disgrace it's taken me this long to actually do this but I'm very grateful to Shona for accepting to come and join us and to take us through her um, results from uh, teacher educators um, do feel free to post your questions en route in the chat um, Shona has uh, lots to tell us in the next 20 minutes and then we'll come back to a Q&A at the end and the context here is adopting open practices uh, for language educators um, so I'm looking forward to hearing more about this thank you very much Shona for agreeing I'm going to switch my uh, webcam off so that I can turn the floor over to you So oh, thank you very much, Teresa, um, for a very warm welcome. It, it's lovely to be here. I haven't done a webinar for a while. It's always a bit of a strange situation because you don't quite know who you're talking to and you have no one in front of you. I'm looking at my dog sleeping in his basket across the room there. But I will, uh, I'm very happy to be here. And as Teresa says, I do have a lot to tell you. I've been working with um, language teachers, uh, particularly English as a foreign language uh, in secondary school classrooms here in the south of France, working on a number of projects. And so I'm going to try and give you some results of that and talk a little bit about how this relates to open education, to open resources, to open practices, and what seem to be some of the challenges uh, that we face in this area. So my title is Adopting Open Practices in Schools, a Call Teacher Education Study. Um, the first question we might say then is why why do we want openness in teacher education and professional development after all we could do as we have been doing for a long time and work with our teachers in their individual classrooms in their individual contexts. Uh, why should we try and open things up well one reason is that we've seen in projects where we've worked with our teachers that there's quite a limited uptake of pedagogical practices uh, changes in practices people are a little bit reluctant to change when they have new technology or when they have new opportunities to change their practice, they tend not to change very quickly. Uh, one reason for this has been suggested by Reinhardt, who says it's a problem of agency, uh, that maybe uh, teachers don't feel um, autonomous, don't feel encouraged, don't feel um, supported in adopting new practices. They don't feel maybe that it's something for them that will help them in their own professional development. Uh, another uh, strand of research that's interesting here, though, is the uh, notion of looking at teachers in the wild themselves. So we, we are uh, kind of examining what teachers do once they're out of training, once they're in their own classrooms and perhaps not being particularly supported. So I hope my sound is OK. Let me know if there's any technical problems there and pop a question in the chat. I'll try and keep my uh, eye on things. Um, but the questions here I'm asking here is what kinds of practices and resources do teachers use? So again, I'm working mostly with language teachers. What factors seem to influence their adoption of practices and what are the challenges and opportunities? Uh, so I'll try and address these. Here's my context though. So I've been working both with in-service teachers and with pre-service teachers. And I've worked uh, in two funded European projects, which are the ITILT projects. And then I've done quite a lot of wor workshops and webinars. And I also, um, uh, I was actually uh, in charge of our master's in teaching uh, languages, the English part of it at the University of Nice for a few years. And I still work with teachers there. So this is my uh, pre-service initial teacher education opportunity. So these are the things I'm going to be talking about. Um, the ITILT project, the first one, you can look at this uh, link that's here, but don't go just now because it's actually down at the moment, itilt.eu, unfortunately it's down. It was a project on interactive whiteboards where we helped teachers, well, we, we actually worked with teacher educators across Europe 
to design teacher education modules. We train teachers to use the interactive whiteboard in their classrooms. We visited, we provided a bit of techno-pedagogical support and we got some data. So we recorded the classrooms, we interviewed the learners, we did what's called video stimulated recall with teachers, which means we look at the video of the class afterwards with the teachers and we talk about what happened. And then we select examples in order to create a website. And you can see we uh, produced quite a large uh, corpus of classroom materials from this project. We had 267 uh, video clips. We had 44 teachers, 81 lessons in seven different languages and at four different educational levels. So uh, hopefully that website will be back up at the moment. We're having a little bit of technical trouble, but that was the, the first opportunity we had to look at what teachers were doing in the classroom. We did it in order to um, produce a repository and to do a bit of research on teacher education. And our question was, uh, with respect to interactive classroom technology, um, does the use of the interactive whiteboard uh, produce greater technological interactivity? Does it mean more interactional engagement? And does it mean more task-oriented teaching? So these are things that we might hope from putting interactive whiteboards in the classrooms. We might hope to get these things. And our, our question was, did we? In order to figure out um, whether we did or not, uh, we looked at three different dimensions of classroom practice. So we looked at technological interactivity, we looked at interactional engagement, and we looked at task orientation. And these references are there all in the link that's in the chat. So you can have a look at these papers if you like. You can also look at the original project. Um, but if you look at the right hand side of this table, you'll see um, the different categories that we use to measure the different types of um, dimensions of practice that we were interested in. So let me just show you then three slides going through these three different um, dimensions. Um, one thing that we did uh, while we were making these the, the website with our 267 videos of IWB supported practice is we created a quick search tool where we allowed people to search the website depending on whether they wanted to look at participant configuration. In other words, who's using the board? Is it the teacher? Is it the learners? Whether they wanted to look at particular IWB tools. Um, so they want to use, see the use of images. They want to see the use of content marking. You can uh, access that directly. And then the, the third variable that we offered was the objective. Uh, do you want to look at the IWB being used for grammar teaching? Do you want to look at it for listening? Are you interested in teaching of literature in foreign languages? So that was our quick search. And from that data, we were then able to do a global evaluation of what kinds of things these teachers were doing. So to remind you, 44 teachers, 267 clips. And we found that the teachers mostly showed us individual learners at the board. And mostly these activities were teacher fronted. We found that the interaction that we saw was quite low level in the sense that they used quite simple tools and they tended to use the same tools all the time. And then we found a balance between the four skills like listening, speaking and reading and so on. And uh, then a balance with the sub skills such as uh, spelling, uh, pronunciation and then cultural objectives. So there was quite a, a range, quite a spread of activities being conducted. Um, the second uh, dimension I mentioned was uh, interactional engagement. And here we're looking a little bit about, um, we're looking at how teachers and learners interact. So the lowest level of interactivity would be drill, where the teacher has the, um, the learners uh, listen and repeat, for example, or do things in a fairly mechanized manner. Display is a little bit more interactive where the, the student goes to the board to show what they have understood. Simulation, more like role play or so on. And here there's a little bit more openness for the little bit more, fewer, more opportunities for the learners to do their own thing. And then communication, we're really not in the practice stage anymore. It's not an exercise, but learners hopefully are really trying to express feelings that they have. So. With these four levels, what did we find? We, we looked at the subset here with my colleague, Julien Kutram-Schmidt, who's in, uh, in Germany. Uh, we looked at French and German EFL teachers in primary and secondary schools, and we found uh, that there was three times more drill and display than simulation and communication. So that means a lot more low level interaction than higher level interaction. We found also the correlation between uh, 
educational level and um, level of interaction. So it was at primary schools that we saw the most drilling and there was more communication at the higher levels. There was also a French-German difference with the German teachers being a bit more ready, I think, to use communication than some of my French primary teachers. So again, um, with the use of the interactive whiteboard, we're not seeing a huge amount of um, interactional engagement. Last thing was task orientation. And here I, I looked only at the French teachers who were in the project. So there were nine French teachers and I found Again, uh, not a huge uptake of task-based learning uh, criteria. Um, the person who used, of my nine teachers, the teacher who used the most uh, task-based approaches was our primary teacher educator, and the least was lower secondary. So um, the finding there um, was of a somewhat conservative or cautious approach to IWB use for teaching with teachers focusing on a limited repertoire of basic functions, such as dragging and dropping or in images, to fulfill relatively circumscribed language learning objectives, vocabulary, pronunciation, receptive skills, and often with a teaching method involving an individual learner working at the IWB before the class. So kind of a limited effect on these different levels of uh, different measures of interaction and engagement uh, for the IWB in the uh, secondary EFL classroom, or actually the primary, also primary EFL classroom in France. So with these findings, we thought uh, we would try to move on into a second project where we would try again to look at these dimensions of interactivity, interactional engagement, task orientation uh, with updated technologies and uh, maybe a slightly different approach on our part. But we want to keep the same measures because we want to compare. So in the second project, this is ITILT 2, 2014 to 17, you see the link there. And this one is up, so you can look at that. Here we looked at, we used mobile and video conferencing te technologies rather than just the IWB. But we had pretty much the same format where we uh, had an education module to uh, help the teachers get ready. We provided a lot of pedagogical support for designing and implementing the activities. And then again, we selected video examples with the teachers in order to create a searchable repository. So this time we looked, uh, we wanted to work more intensively with individual teachers. So we collected less, um, we collected fewer examples. We had 76 video clips, 31 different tasks, 22 teachers, four levels at three different, four languages at three different educational levels. And here I'm going to compare the two for you. So I found that um, in ITILT 2, uh, there was um, a lot more use of groups. So whereas in the first project I mentioned, the activities were teacher fronted with a low level of interaction and it was a lot of one teacher, one learner at the board. Here we had groups of learners and not so many with the teacher alone. We also found that there were more active affordances um, where learners were doing things with the technology, they were active rather than receiving input for them. So that was a 36% against 43% um, comparison there. And we also found that there was less grammar and a lot more listening and speaking going on. So uh, an improvement in technological interactive and uh, use of more um, active objectives, if you like, uh, from the first project to the second. Uh, the second dimension again, interactual engagement. Here we're talking about moving from drilling up to uh, communication. And we found in the second project that learners were more active. There was more engagement at all levels. There was less drilling, even though we had more primary classes, which is where we'd seen drilling in the first place. And there was a lot more active engagement, which increased with educational levels. So the highest level of active engagement uh, at the university level. So let me show you some bar charts. Um, if you look at the bottom uh, bar there, you can see that there was 14% of listening, 12% drilling, 32% drill, 9% simulation, and the most that we saw was communication. So across the different levels, we had a lot more communication going on. At university level, you can see a large amount of communication. Secondary level, it's evenly split between drill, um, sorry, between display, simulation, and communication. And it's at primary level that we're a little more of the learners just listening, or drilling. So a lot more interactional uh, engagement here. Um, and we can summarize that uh, if we look also at the task-based language teaching part. Um, 
I looked at the 22 teachers over the 76 clips and I did the same kind of evaluation as I'd done with the French teachers in ITL1, and I found that they were much more task-oriented. So this is good, because this is really a focus of the project this time. So um, it, it was clear that the teachers were much more convinced, if you like, that uh, task-based language teaching was the way to go. Although we saw some variability across language uh, the languages that were being taught across countries, education level, and even type of technology. But we probably don't have enough data to be able to tease that out in statistically meaningful ways. So that gives us a sort of overview of what kinds of practices and resources teachers are using in the context that we've been working in the project. And now we want to know why is this, uh, what are the challenges, and what reasons seem to be behind the, this type of adoption. So now I'm going to look a little bit more about what my master's teachers are doing and what teachers in workshops and webinars can tell me about what they're doing in their classroom. Um, maybe five minutes on this, which will be a wee bit longer than Teresa wanted to give me, but. Uh, She'll jump in if, if she wants me to uh, go quicker because the slides are definitely going to be available. So workshop, uh, shops and webinars, working on uh, language teaching and technology, open educational practices, and using a participant questionnaire after these um, uh, workshops and webinars to follow up and see what people can tell us about what they're doing. So this follow-up was done by uh, using a 20-minute online questionnaire, which I built on Google Forms. Uh, these participants from projects and uh, teaching programs, uh, looking at technology and pedagogy and asking for also some evidence or some details, if you like, of teaching activities and lesson plans that teachers are using. So different questions on these different dimensions and then some findings. Um, which I'm still I'm still working on these. I have a, a chapter hopefully coming up on uh, in a new book, a collective volume on uh, open educational practices. Uh, but I'm sharing some preliminary res results here, um, where I have responses mostly from the teachers that I have been working with at the University of Nice. So the bulk of the respondents uh, to my questionnaire were lower secondary EFL teachers. So working with 11 to 15 year olds in French middle schools, they have the masters from our university, they're in their late 20s and they've been teaching for three to five years. The, I had them fill out the Europass um, questionnaire, which you can find online, and they uh, rated themselves as independent digital users. So that's number two on a three point scale. Um, they said that they were using communicative language teaching and ta task-based language teaching approaches. And yet there was a little bit of conflict because when I asked them about their attitudes to language teaching and acquisition, they seemed to show fairly conservative views. So they wanted to use these practices, but somehow weren't exactly coherent in their views of language teaching um, with respect to those practices. Uh, their technology is kind of useful to know what they had, what, since I'm going to tell you what they're saying. So they tended to have a single computer in the classroom with internet and a projector. They use Google Apps, they use VLC for, um, for digital audio, and they use online resources such as uh, YouTube and Quizlet and dictionaries and so on. They report that they find the materials online, but they tend not to share with other colleagues, and they only interact with people that they already know, so people that they studied with or with colleagues at the, uh, at, uh, in their schools, but not so much on Twitter, Facebook, or on other networks uh, online. The, when I asked them about their objectives, their main objectives were to get learners motivated or to keep them motivated and to provide individualized feedback. These were the things that they most wanted to be able to do in their teaching. Um, so I mentioned this little conflict between they said this is the method they use, communicative language teaching or task-based language teaching. But when I asked them about their beliefs about language teaching and learning, 48% of this group said errors should be corrected immediately to avoid the formation of bad habits. So as you know, this is a um, behaviorist approach to language teaching, which is pretty much incompatible with communicative and task-based approaches. 78% um, aim to teach simple before complex grammar rules. So this question, it's not so easy to interpret because in language, in TBLT and CLT, 
there's not so much focus on teaching of grammar rules, so it could be seen as a separate question. On the other hand, we do expect that if you're working in task-based language teaching, you probably don't think of a progression of simple to complex grammar. Um, you think of teaching the structures that they need in order to um, fulfill the communicative objectives that they have. Um, when I looked at their materials, so some of the teachers were happy to show me lesson plans and units that been, they'd been working with, and they pretty much uh, revealed that they're working with a grammar syllabus, that they had vocabulary exercises, that they had reading and comprehension exercises, and that the task-based or communicative approach um, objectives tended to come in in the form of a final task once this grammar and vocabulary had been explicitly taught or pre-taught. Uh, let me show you some of their comments. Uh, an EFL teacher said, the iPad's still my best friend and now teaching with it, looking forward to have kids using some of them at the same time. Somebody else said, I'm trying to integrate all things technological in Italian teaching, if only to try and motivate the middle schoolers of my school. Last year, we started using class sets of iPads with the pupils and we see that they like activities on screen much better, even if it's the same as on paper. So, a little bit of um, commentary on the technologies that they're using. Um, and then a question about this uh, reluctance to share that I just mentioned. So somebody said in an email after filling out my questionnaire, they said, I completed your survey and to be honest, I was quite reluctant sharing my teaching materials. I don't feel completely confident about it, especially if I have to, if I have to send it to you. You've always been kind and non-judgmental about my work, so here it is. So we can feel that these teachers uh, are nervous about showing what they're doing in the classroom. And this teacher said, I was inspired by an existing chapter made by a colleague found on internet, but I adapted almost everything, maybe because I didn't feel comfortable teaching with something I didn't come up with. So this is another, um, another uh, comment that comes up, a notion that a teacher should create their own materials, that perhaps the most important part of the teacher's work is the preparation of those materials and so this is an obvious break on adopting open practices if people feel they feel reluctant to share they don't want people to judge what they're doing and they also feel somehow that it's cheating to take other people's materials um, that, that that's not what a good teacher does so uh, we can see the challenges here conclusions then um, I want to say here that I think that call teacher education can really support pedagogical transformation and in structured funded projects it's a very good place to do it. The challenges that we have experienced in our projects then has been understanding and implementing effective pedagogical choices. So we see some gratuitous interactivity, we see some artificial pretext for tasks, and we see a, prefer a preference for traditional pedagogical exercises, as I was just saying there. And then the second challenge, reluctance to share beyond local communities of practices because of ambivalent feelings about the utility and about the um, acceptability of uh, taking others' work and using them in the classroom. So as I say, I'm working on these this questionnaire to compare the projects and workshop with seminar, uh, with semester course participants. Uh, I'm also working on a new project, which I'll give a little plug here. This is less on languages and more on open practices uh, more generally, and we're looking more at higher education than school practices. But uh, that's really not um, the main thing I'm looking at here, school practices. So I'll be very happy to have your questions here. Let me remind you of my title, my name, that's my Twitter handle, that's my WordPress, and that's the direct link for the references to uh, what I've been talking about today. So um, a little bit longer than allowed, but I uh, hope it was useful to you. And I'm ready for any questions that you might have. Shona, thank you so much. And you did such a grand job to get all of that in <laughs> such a short space of time. So you're very welcome to overrun. Um, there's, it's so rich, actually, the things that you've given us here and the resources. I'm just going to share that link again to your um, blog post um, so that people can follow up. And I, I'm interested, as I was listening to you, in the, th in the resonation and in, in, in what resonates with my own experience of 
um, teacher practices and, and I'm sure there are others in the room as well who will be aware and have um, a take on this but I did some work uh, for a project within Warwick around open educational practices um, in higher education and through the research that I did with with students we worked together and um, and tried to get a picture of the barriers to adoption of open practices mm -hmm. um, there are many things in what you're saying that, that resonate with that, particularly the anxiety of, around sharing. And I can imagine in a school situation um, that that anxiety is every bit as strong uh, in the UK as, as you were finding in France. Um, it, it, it's this worry that somebody is judging you. Um, and and it, it really worries me that people as professional educators feel this way because in fact we need as a community to sort to, to support each other and if we're going to grow and change our practice it's actually the interactions that we have with each other that helps us do that um, so perhaps you know the, the kind of um, rather bureaucratic approach that has been taken uh, certainly in the UK in, in schools has um, helped disempower people from actually finding their own um, agency in terms of evaluating and reconnecting with their practice. Absolutely. Um, I, I think I think I kind of expected that teachers would be worried about uh, sharing materials because we can see when we're working with them, they feel a bit reluctant even sharing them with you as the teacher educator. But maybe what surprised me this time was to really understand that they also thought it was cheating. That if you go and find someone's well-designed resources and you just use them in the classroom somehow you're cheating because you're not creating your own resources and this is bad obviously because it means people don't share uh, and don't take what's available but it's also bad because it shows that people don't understand teachers don't feel that a good interpretation of someone else's materials implementing it in the classroom is is a very skilled thing to do it's very uh, important and if sometimes I think of this with with younger teachers less experienced teachers when you watch them in the classroom um, they've thought so much about the design of the activities that they don't think about the implementation and just implementing someone else's materials is a huge job in itself it's a particularly respectable job and and somehow we don't um, we don't let them see that that's very important um, and I think it's because of inspections it's because uh, we're working at a distance and it's always easier to look at a lesson plan than it is to go look at somebody teach and so we somehow pass this message that the materials are important and not the rest mm, absolutely I th yeah and 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 that in fact what you are doing needs to be informed by theory and you need to keep coming back to that basis I think and and I think you know the the pragmatics of actually um, designing for learning under the pressures the time pressures and I'm sure they're very similar in France as they are in the UK uh, prevents us having the headspace sometimes to actually think about what we're doing and why we do it um, I, I was particularly interested in the in the contrast of uh, these two um, these two groups that you talked about, the ITILT and ITILT2, where you know once you had put more input and support in, in, in place, people started to change their practice more readily. And, and it worries me that sometimes we take the support out of uh, and the time factor out of the equation and just say, well, you should be teaching like this. Well, you know, how how can you if you don't have the breathing space to think about what you're doing and why you're doing it and maybe even to compare your practice with those of others? Um, Celine's raising the question about this feeling of cheating um, and uh, at something that perhaps feeds into that a little bit one of the things i use with my pre-service um uh, well they're, they're actually undergrads of languages who have expressed an interest in mm -hmm. teaching language um is to run a feed from the mfl twitterati into their um into their vle page i haven't asked them to go on twitter i know they're a bit anxious about that but the, if you watch the feed from 
uh, the MFL Twitterati, um, they do a lot of sharing of resources between each other. And, you know, you'll see people putting out a call. Have you got something to teach the preterite in Spanish or whatever? Um, so there's a sort of culture there um, that that helps us think more about the community of practice that is a teaching, a professional community of practice. Um, and, and it gives us permission, therefore, to actually participate. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really interesting to think about the concept of teaching, perhaps in the in the frame of thinking about things like Creative Commons licensing. So, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, when you are sharing, you're you're sharing a piece of yourself, and you but you're also having maintaining some control over what can happen. Um, so I, I've got a gift for you, Shona, and it's a gift mm. uh, you may be already aware of, but it's a gift for everybody who's participating here, and it comes from the University of Texas. It was shared online yesterday. Um, and it's part of their celebration and their contribution to Open Educational Week. Um, so they have put together a, a free and open course around um, adopting open uh, practices and an introduction to OER, they've called it. And that, that just the choice of that title is interesting because perhaps OER is more established than open mm -hmm. practice. But to me, a, a set of resources don't mean a great deal unless they're being used. So this this little um, course that you can do, and, and it's again released under Creative Commons licensing, so you can even sort of import it and, um, and ad adopt and adapt it and remix it, um, helps in, induct people into the skills of um, effective open practice. Um, because certainly the work of Catherine Cronin and others uh, that we would be quite familiar with in the Open Ed SIG tells us that practicing openly is, is a complex, situated and quite a personal activity. Um, and people do kind of have to make their own way and their own set of decisions according to their context. Um, so, but it's interesting for people, I think, to know that they are supported in that and that there is a community of practice of teachers who are interested in just this thing. I know we've had some um, scandals in terms of uh, language resources that have been made available freely online and then uh, taken and sold. Mm. So, you know, and that sort of thing really does upset people and I can understand that. Um, mm. And, you know, that's why we really need the copyright literacy to understand what we do when we share things openly online. Um, and I think that Coral uh, book uh, will be really helpful. It'd be nice to see some translations of it, actually, to have, uh, uh, yeah. have some localised versions of it. But yeah, just to come back to that idea of resources versus practices, you know, if we didn't worry so much, I know it takes a long time to prepare things, but if we didn't worry so much if we, about the actual teaching materials, the things that you're going to take in like handouts or links to things or, or questions or so on, whatever your teaching unit is, if that wasn't so valuable and we put more value onto what you do with them in the classroom, then maybe people wouldn't get so upset about things being stolen because you can't steal someone's practice. You can only steal their the, the the supports in French it's called you know it's called teaching support like the materials and I think you know uh, MIT was one of the first universities to put open courseware on and people were saying like why are you putting these materials on and they're saying well that's not it uh, the, the 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 materials uh, that's not the education that's not what counts so it's okay for it to be there and for other people to look at it we can still have students come to university and pay to get this training because what we put online is not the whole thing. Uh, and I think it, it's important for us to, as I, I showed a, a little example up there in the chat of how we can try to bring the focus back to what actually happens in the classroom rather than the materials that you use by having uh, teachers work together and teach their own, um, teach the same lesson. So I, I did this with pre-service teachers where I had them work in groups of three or four in different schools. They taught the same lesson, they filmed each other teaching it, and then they talked about it. And for them, it was 
very interesting. It was quite a revelation to see that the very same set of materials would produce very different classroom uh, outcomes depending on who was teaching and who was in the class and how they participated and what time of day it was and so on. So these are much harder to, to work with and I think that's why people are not going towards the practices and focusing on the resources. That's a really useful and interesting perspective, Shona. I'm very grateful yeah. for that. I think I think what we've tried to do within the SIG is to to focus in yeah. on the practices and also to focus in on how um, we recognise engagement with the practices. Um, so in some cases that's through open badges and Coral have a great little system for um, open badges uh, for practitioners that you can um, earn. Um, and uh, I've, I've had my students just recently in the virtual exchange that we're doing with, with Poland uh, review some open resources in order to earn their badge from Coral as an OER reviewer. Um, and I, I think that sort of recognition helps then because it, it helps to build a community of people you can look to for suggestions and discussions. And yes, Deb, you're just back in time to talk badges. Deb and I have, have talked open badges for a long, long time. <laughs> and uh, yes, there's some, there's some great resources um, from the Coral website there. I'd be interested to get some perspectives from other countries because clearly we've got a French and a UK perspective on, on language teaching here. Um, right, Scotland, great, Sandy, thank you. Fear of sharing is just more evidence that teachers tend to have a hugely high standards towards their learning materials. Yes, I think this is true. I think sometimes we let the um, the good enough be the, uh, you know, the perfect be the enemy of the good enough, whatever the expression is. Um, you know, we have to accept that we are under time pressure, our resources, and I'm I'm certainly guilty, hold my hand up, this on my SlideShare account, you will find slides with typos. Every now and again, when I spot them, I take them down and change them. Um, but I kind of think, well, actually, it's more about the approach. And the approach is part of the practice, as Shona was saying, that you kind of, um, okay, this is how I was going to, I'm going to deal with a particular issue that needs to be dealt with in my context um, and I won't necessarily get it right but this is my first stab and this is this is where I'm going on this um, but it does take a degree of almost a sort of sort of safety blanket <laughs> mm. and, and having people on side like yourself as, as experienced teacher trainers who say you know this this quality issue is kind of secondary to the real quality, which is the quality of the interaction you're having with your mm -hmm. learners. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's it's always easy to find typos. I can find typos and problems and quality issues in course books any day of the week once they're mm -hmm. published and they're fixed, of course. At least when we're working in the digital, we can amend and create and, and improve and iteratively um, work on uh, OER. But our practice is probably the most important point in terms of how we um, interpret what we do and how we improve what we do. Um, I, we had a comment earlier from Marjorie. Marjorie, I'm not sure if you're still with us. Um, can we have a Croatian perspective on teaching? How, how do Croatian teachers view openness and open practice? would be interested to and we've we have Celine here from France as well Mariana uh, hi yes hi thank you yeah so uh, Croatian teachers um, it's similar like what we discussed before uh, this thing about cheating if they find the uh, elements online on internet or get from their colleagues they would use it but the general practice is that every teacher prepares his or her own materials mm -hmm. and I it's a kind of a time consuming and perhaps linked to the society's uh, uh, vision and image of a teacher. So a good teacher should invest time to prepare his or her own materials. Otherwise, uh, his colleagues uh, tend to see it and uh, students and teacher and uh, Parents tend to see this person as a, as a bad teacher. I don't Absolutely. know why, but, but it, it, it's a kind of an image that is stuck here in Croatia, um, uh, and which is also related to the general image in the society that uh, 
teacher's job is not very important. It's an easy job and anybody can do it. So um, maybe oh, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Mariana. That's really interesting. Yeah. It's kind of when you think of, uh, you know, the last thing you'd want to you'd want to stop people doing is creating context specific resources for teaching because, you know, that engagement I think is is really important. Um, but it's rarely recognised, as you say, that there's rarely rarely recognition of the importance, the significance of that. And and I suppose my my shift in mindset that's happened really since the sort of normalization of digital creation has been that it's it, the first 15 years of my teaching career were fairly traditional so the resources that I created I shared with other teachers who were in my school but otherwise they were stored in in folders and they were part of my sort of repertoire of, of resources but since we've gone digital now I tend to think well that that might be of interest to people beyond my classroom, beyond my immediate context. And then you kind of navigate the tricky and sometimes um, uh, daunting practice of sl sharing things slightly more widely. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the um, one of the tools I've become aware of just recently, I haven't actually used it yet, um, has been something called Wiki Slides. Um, I've, I've for a long time used Wiki um, there it is, slide wiki, sorry, and get the, get the right thing and put the link into here. So, you know, you spend all this time thinking about the materials that you're creating um, and how they'll meet the needs within your classroom. But if, if you make them available on a platform that actually shows that they're attributable to you, then you're making yourself visible to other stakeholders to say, look, I, I am engaged in this um, mm -hmm. practice. Um, and, and this is something I'm interested in um, and my level of copyright literacy and digital understanding is greater um, than you know than it was than before digital practice came along um, I, yeah I think it's worth taking a look at I haven't actually moved my slides to it yet but I'm thinking about it, it was it was actually produced as part of an open project there we go and we've got Kelly in the room <laughs> Kelly Kelly can you put your mic on and tell us a little bit about your repository work because uh, I think that's also very um, very very relevant to what Shona's been telling us about if you have the opportunity I don't know if you're in an open plan <laughs> office it might not be I, might sorry not. I just had to run oh, and get the dog to stop barking um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, well, you had so, to meet Shona's dog. <laughs> <laughs> mine, aren't, mine aren't sleeping quietly. Um, so just to mention SlideWiki, obviously it's a European uh, project, but there are a, a couple of uh, key people that are a part of the school I'm in, Electronics and Computer Science at Southampton, that are, are part of that project as well. Um, so I'm involved, uh, I look after EdShare, which is uh, an open source um, digital content platform and uh, it was created at Southampton many, many, many years ago, um, but was all part of this uh, helping people transition and change culture around sharing in the institution. So at its outset, it wasn't about openness. It was about helping people taking content out of these closed spaces or even on personal sort of network spaces um, and getting encouraging staff to share with one another just within a school, so within what feels like a safe space. Um, and then to help those that were perhaps more confident to then start sharing university wide. And then um, the system also allows the option to share openly as well. So it's got a huge amount of flexibility that um, people can utilize it in the ways in which they're comfortable. But at its heart, it is about openness. So the metadata is all open. So what we find, and this is linked with the ePrint software, which is used for publication purposes, is it it's, it helps people on that journey of transitioning from closed to open. So mm -hmm. if, even if it's it's one step to to get it off a personal web space, you know, which no one else, oh, sorry, not even a personal web space, say a network drive or a USB stick, it gets it off there, or it gets it out of a closed VLE mm -hmm. um, and into a place where other people can see that it's visible. So even if they chose to only share it with uh, colleagues or with a school, other people can see it exists. 
and once people can see it exists and you know they can contact each other they can network with one another and then suddenly oh yes yeah that's fine you can share that I'll, I'll let you have a look at that and it takes people on that that gradual journey towards sharing more widely and then hopefully sharing more openly as well yes and i think kelly you know it's worth pointing out here as well the work that um kate borthwick did on on your platform for um uh, languages and again there was this sort of incremental sharing and community building that happened through a sort of social aspect of the repository and I, I, i've always had um misgivings about repositories because repositories tend to be places where p things go to repose and you never <laughs> see them again Absolutely. just like my folders that you know stuff is it sits there so you need a reason a purpose to go there and you need a community and i think um humbox and languages box which were i think early iterations of um the software that kelly's uh, talking about uh, we're really good at recognizing that importance of of, of a community around um, a set of resources and this incremental approach again is something that we've adopted um, with my students because they're very very reluctant to do anything openly and so we've used our ePortfolio software Mahara um, to give them the opportunity to decide in terms of permissions who can see what when um, and to think that through um, I think we've talked in the open ed SIG in, in previous webinars about how open can become closed because if I've made decisions to make something openly available I may at some point decide to reverse those decisions because of whatever because of some sort of um, uh, vulnerability perhaps because uh, of uh, working in a context that's perhaps um, more difficult to be open in and some of us work in very uh, in very in very vulnerable contexts in, in some countries um, so it is quite a personal decision and it and it's helpful to to support people in thinking that through our salvor thank you thank you is another contribution as well yes hp5 i've been using hp5 for, for a little while now using the org what i'm what i'm a little bit worried and disconcerted about is hp5 is now going to be encouraging people to create and maintain their resources in hp5.com which will be a paid resource and we're seeing this increasingly as our internet spaces which have been free and open are monetizing um, so although everything you create through hp5 and i've certainly encouraged my students to use it um, can then be exported and then used um, through other platforms and things because it's an open source file type um, it's kind of worrying that teachers will be asked to um, stomp up the cash yeah. uh, because you know we're already I think as if we look at the profession and I'm at the point where I'm about to leave the profession really sort of 30 odd years on but I you know I worry about young people especially in the UK who are entering teaching with huge debts from their learning already um, struggling to be able to afford um, homes who are then being asked to um, fork out from the money that they earn more money to support their web presence or the tools that they use in order yeah. to do their jobs and 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 that's a little bit worrying and and yes kelly the commercialization of data needs to be considered as well yeah. as access i think there are some very big issues to think about um in this area that and, and there's sort of issues that i think for us as maybe digital evangelists to a point because you know i think we've all experienced the positives of actually mm -hmm. engaging with technology we have to adopt a kind of a critical approach um to what we're advocating as well and be aware that uh, it's it's about more than just imitating practice it's it's about knowing what is actually going on behind the scenes uh, particularly with algorithms and <laughs> things interfering yeah. um i found this i'm just going to add this link to the chat which is a, a post recently from maha bali um who 
is, is intensively engaged in discussing open and writes from um, uh, from Egypt, which again brings another sort of perspective into the discussion where, you know, our, our teaching context can be very different. Um, and I think she is very good at exploring some of the complexities of open practice and thinking about who gets marginalised from our discussions and our um, uh, practice. Because once we actually turn to technology to deliver um, tools, so we maybe select iPads to be used in a classroom or we, or we decide that we're all going to uh, use a particular tool, there are ramifications and sometimes they are accessibility issues. Sometimes they are simply making some people within our teaching cohort uncomfortable because perhaps they don't have the financial means to participate or perhaps through um, disabilities they don't have as much access as the rest of us sort of take for granted with the technology. So I think for me that's that critical aspect of reflection and, and no one person is going to have all the insights needed. Um, so you know for me that puts the emphasis back on the importance of a community of practice. Um, that we uncover some of the uh, vagaries, some of the things going on behind the black boxes that we're perhaps less than aware of. Um, and, and we question them and we ask ourselves who is being excluded. Um, yeah. Salvo, do you, would you like to use your mic and perhaps tell us a little bit more about your context? Tell us where you're from or perhaps just pop that into the chat. And Celine as well, we haven't heard from you about your context. So if there's anything you'd like to contribute, it would be really valued because the, the purpose of today's event really, as well as sharing the wonderful research that, that Shona um, has been doing, and, and it's, as I said earlier, a very rich resource, um, is to find out what more we can learn uh, from each other. Reykjavik in Iceland, wow, okay. Great. So I think we've gone beyond my my four countries now. We're into a fifth. <laughs> Excellent. Great to have you here. Um, to, what's the attitude to openness in Iceland? We were in Finland, obviously, not very long ago, and, and there did seem to be a lot of interest in, in Finland. So do feel free to use the text chat, Salvor, if you prefer, that's fine. Um, to, if you do want to use the mic, if you come down to the bottom right hand corner, click on the pink button at the bottom of the screen and you'll see a wheel and that wheel um, will help you connect your microphone. It will run a test and, and connect you. Um, so, yes, we have lots of uh, lots of support here from folk who will help you if you do want to to use that. I think the contextual element of this and different government and societal attitudes towards teaching as Mariana um, discussed earlier um, is very significant isn't it I, I, I've been working with through Clavier for, for some time with um, French uh, higher education professionals and, and there yes you can see there is a difference of expectation and um, I'm sorry, uh, Ah. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. I, yes. I, I, oh. the microphone. I, I just want to tell you about the situation about open. open That's great. Thank you. In Iceland. It's not on the agenda right now. It used to be three or four years ago, but right now there is uh, somehow other issues in, in education. So I am with a very small group of people trying to get it on the agenda, get people to understand why it's important for, especially for such a very small language group. We are only uh, 300,000 uh, people speaking Icelandic. So, yes. uh, so it's uh, hugely important. It, so it I, totally is. 
I, I had I had totally uh, um, erroneously assumed Salvor that I would hear a male voice. <laughs> me too. Me too. <laughs> Good for you for admitting it. Totally my surprise. <laughs> but you're very welcome, and and that's really interesting because clearly you're an open practice advocate, and certainly open practice for small uh, language groups is very useful we're seeing that you know in minority languages just in terms of raising the visibility of those languages um, it's very important um, yes so we need perhaps we need you to to uh, get a, to go along to the coral website and and uh, get some uh, accreditation for your advocacy of yes. open practice in Iceland, um, making things visible, because I think that tends to be the point at which um, uh, stakeholders start to take notice that, you know, you have a particular um, belief in terms of the social value of working in the open. Yeah. Um, and and often that's that's just, uh, as you say, it falls off the agenda. It's often neglected. So it's very important that we do um, keep that uh, visible and available. Yeah. I'm I'm very aware that we're coming to the end of our time, and I'm I'm going to because I know that there are going to be um, other things that people didn't feel they had time to say. I've just set up a little jam board here, um, and ah okay, this is right. Okay, Celine, thank you. Yes. Professional self-confidence. Yes, I, isn't that so important, Shona? Mm. That we that we uh, allow people the freedom yeah. and and. Yeah, the trouble is, I mean, I, I don't know where Celine is in France or what context she's working yes, with, but what France. what what strikes me, maybe this is the same in Croatia or in other places where people are working in compulsory uh, school um, contexts. Uh, you have the inspection. You the the the. During pre-service training, the big fear is the inspector looking at the class at the end of the year. And so uh, it's hard to come out of the idea of um, being a student and being uh, somehow low in the hierarchy and, and to be someone who stands at the front of the class and makes their own decisions because you have official programs and you have an inspector who will come to see if you're using and respecting the official programs so uh when you talk about agency here it's it's um let's say it's not something they're expecting to hear mm. Mm. so we're, we're saying that actually our systems are limiting the agency of our our, our teachers just the tad yes yes <laughs> which is which is definitely something we as parents wouldn't want to see and you know as a teacher within a classroom you don't want to feel that your students mm. have limited agency you want them to to own their learning and take ownership of their learning yeah and i think there'll be a knock-on effect if the teacher does if the teacher feels they're taking orders from the ministry and the inspectors then they probably feel they want to give orders to their learners whereas if the teacher feels the teacher is available to or is open or or allowed somehow to to make their own decisions uh, as as professionals to use Celine's word then they might then be more willing to give the learners more agency. And we know for language teaching, but I'm sure for other types of education, it's very important that you take the language to use it, you appropriate it yourself. You don't just repeat what other people have told you to repeat. Yes, I couldn't sum it up better than that, Shona. That was absolutely <laughs> brilliant. And, uh, I want to take that clip and play it everywhere I go. <laughs> that's, that's so important. I mean, we we talk uh, as teachers about modelling, and and yet we're not telling our stakeholders that we can't model what we value. Um, and that's a, nice way that's a shame. Ooh, just added the joining the joining the open dots. Padlet link to the Jamboard. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I, I didn't mention the Jamboard is simply a place where you can um, click on a T and that's a sticky note and choose a colour and add any thoughts. So we, we will keep this open going forward so we can uh, perhaps build on today's webinar and think about the connections that we can make to support each other to um, advocate open practice. But open practice with your eyes open, that will ring bells for Shona from mm -hmm. some 
<laughs> work we did, we invested quite a lot of time in some time back. Um, critical open practice, um, mm. helping to support people thinking about their decisions in the digital. Um, and I think as a, as a group, as a network, we can support each other. And, and I'm so grateful to you all for coming and making the effort to join the session today. I think we've had a very rich and very useful interaction and I hope we'll carry it forward. Um, I have to uh, finish off just with um, an open ed SIG um, slide just to remind you of who we are and why we've brought this together today. So let's just... Um, Oops, sorry. It popped up and then it flashed. <laughs> yeah. well, okay. While you're looking for it, let me just say, to Teresa, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for your expert um, organization of this space. And and uh, that's not the word I want. I, I thought that you were you did an excellent job in getting people in and able to say things. It it makes a difference. I think sometimes webinars can feel a bit like you're broadcasting and you don't really know who's there and who's listening whereas here you you did a great job in, in getting people involved and so we got some feedback and some ideas from other people so you're really very skilled at that and thank you oh you're very very welcome and thank you and thanks for everybody to everybody who's contributed so we've done this for the open education special interest group as you can see on the slide there we're supported by the association for learning technology and they've um, helped us set up our own website and uh, space where we can interact and you'll find us just by googling open education sig sig um, do come and join the conversation and uh, yeah I hope you all have a wonderful um, open education week there are there are so many more gifts out there thanks to open education week and I'm glad that we've had the opportunity to uh, to offer our um, our part in that and great Telly uh, uh, Kelly if you'd like to pop um, pop that information onto the Jamboard that would be Brilliant. Thank you, Salvor. We feel for you and we're certainly going to support you in, in advocating for openness. Um, and thank you, Céline, for coming along. Merci. <laughs> we have a strong contingent from France, which is yes. great. <laughs> I'll switch the recording off now.